Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this webinar on immigration, immigrant workers, and the labor movement, which is part of the introduction um, to labor for undergraduates at Berkeley called Work, Justice, and the Labor Movement. My name is Anibel Ferris Comello. I go by she, her, hers as pronouns. I'm the director of community engaged academic initiatives at the UC Berkeley Labor Center and faculty at the Goldman School of Public Policy. I'd like to extend a special welcome to all our guest participants who have joined us via Zoom for this hybrid public sociology class session. This event would not be possible without the support of my colleague, Carla Gutierrez, program coordinator at the Labor Center, who skillfully navigated many uncertainties and restrictions imposed on us by the global pandemic. She and I are also grateful for the assistance of Kirsten Willer, uh, program coordinator at the Labor Center and also appointed as queen of webinars. Thank you so much, Carla and Kirsten, for your assistance. We are delighted that this event and class session is co-sponsored by the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative, or BME, the Institute of Governmental Studies, IGS, and the Multicultural Community Center, MCC. Many thanks to the directors of these campus bodies for joining us in uplifting the need for dialogue about US immigration policy and practice. Today is Indigenous Day, People's Day. It commemorates the histories, legacies of resistance and resilience of indigenous peoples across the continent. So let us begin by acknowledging that besides the Native American communities, we are all immigrants or descendants of slaves and immigrants who have had unequal access to land wealth, resources, and ultimately power within racial capitalism. We have come a long way from the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, which made Native Americans the last main group to access citizenship by birth, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, which gave preferences for family reunification, employment and refugee status, to the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, which provided amnesty for established residents, it enhanced requirements of employers and expanded guest worker visa programs. It also gave new life to organizing of low paid immigrant workers. We also have the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or DACA of 2012 and the Muslim Travel Ban of 2017. It goes without saying that immigration policy and practice in the US has a long way to go before it is humane and fair. To shed light on directions in which we can head in, we are delighted to have with us Professor Ruth Milkman, who along with Deepak Bhargava and Penny Lewis co-edited the book, Immigration Matters, Movements, Visions, and Strategies for a Progressive Future. Ruth Milkman is a distinguished professor of sociology at the City University of New York, CUNY Graduate Center, and the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Ruth Milkman is a sociologist of labor and labor movements who has written on a variety of topics involving work and organized labor in the United States. Her most recent books are Immigrant Labor and the New Precariat and On Gender, Labor and Inequality. I would like to welcome Ruth to our class and to this webinar to shed some light on this new book and to um, be able to enter into a dialogue with us here on the West Coast on which directions immigration could take. Thank you very much for being with us. The floor is yours. And I want to just remind our participants, both in front of me as well as uh, remote, that you can add your questions or comments in the chat. And I am fortunate enough to have Carla and Kirsten monitoring the chat box. Thank you, Ruth. The floor is yours, or well, the screen is yours. 
Thanks, Annie Bell. It's great to sort of see you again. And um, I noticed in the list of um, people watching this, a lot of old friends and um, glad to see you all here. I'm gonna try to share my screen since I have a little PowerPoint to share with you. Let's see if that works. Okay, um, so as Annabelle said, I'm here to give you a kind of overview of this new book that I helped um, edit and which is an attempt to bring us out of the four years of darkness that we experienced under the Donald Trump presidency. Um, I'm just gonna offer a quick overview of what this is all about and then um, Annabelle assures me there'll be plenty of time for Q&A. So let me just start by explaining where this came from. Um, we organized a, well, it was supposed to be a conference pre-pandemic in early 2020, and it ended up being a webinar um, with the goal of trying to think through what a progressive immigration policy agenda might look like in the post-Trump era. Notice that we did this before we knew if there was going to be a post-Trump era anytime soon. Um, but as those of you who follow these things know, under Trump, a guy called Stephen Miller, who was very close to the president, the former president, um, engaged in systematic efforts to restrict immigration, not only unauthorized immigration, but also legal immigration. And he took a very... Uh, dogged approach, nothing stood in his way. And as I think we've all seen the results of that. Um, so one thing was to think about, okay, how do we start over again, reset the conversation and the policymaking process um, if there were a new president, which of course there has been since this book was produced. Um, another thing we were concerned about is the so-called comprehensive immigration reform approach that dominated the first decade of this century. Um, at least up to 2008 and arguably all through the Obama years. Um, and the idea there was that, you know, immigration reform involved sort of two complementary parts. One was getting control over the border and border enforcement and, you know, having some kind of systematic way of um, regulating that. And on the other hand, a path to citizenship and legal status for the estimated 11 million um, undocumented immigrants who already live in the United States. And the idea was, you know, you would have a kind of quid pro quo between those two things. And what happened in the years that that was the approach is that we got the border enforcement or at least attempts at it and, and an increasingly militarized border and increasingly cruel and humane treatment of those who did attempt to cross the border, a lot of whom actually perished in the process and none of the other part apart from DACA, which Annie Bell already mentioned. So as, um, as we put this book together, our view was that that isn't gonna work. We need a new approach. Um, so for the conference and then later for the book, we recruited a variety of people, not just, um, it's not an academic book really, although there are a few of the chapters written by um, academics. There are also activists and advocates who contributed. Um, so it's, tries to bring together a bunch of different perspectives. And some of the chapters are actually um, based on interviews that we conducted and then edited with some of the activists who don't really, aren't in the habit of writing book chapters. Um, so another goal, which is what I'm gonna start with today, is to kind of debunk some of the common misconceptions about immigration, both historically and today. Um, so I'm actually gonna begin with that and then share with you a little bit more about what's in the book and then we can discuss it. Um, and again, the audience is really um, meant to be as broad as possible. Anyone who wants to understand, you know, why the immigration system is such a mess in the United States and how to replace it with something humane and orderly. Um, spoiler attack, I um, want to tell you that our view is that immigration should be much more expansive, legal immigration, than it currently is, that we should be welcoming lots more immigrants than um, the United States policy currently permits and refugees. So maybe it'll become clear the logic of that a little bit later. Um, okay, so first some myths and facts. And I guess this is um, especially for, I, I know that Annabelle's class is here. Um, and I bet 
since it's California, a lot of you are immigrants or the children of immigrants. So maybe these myths are not in your head, but they are in that of the wider public. Um, so one is this idea that most immigrants are quote unquote illegal, unauthorized immigrants. Another that many um, people in this country believe is that most immigrants are Latinx or as other the other terms for that, Latino, Hispanic, whatever word you prefer. Um, another view is that most immigrants are poorly educated. And yet another is that the US, you know, it, it, immigration is out of control. We have many more immigrants as a share of the overall population than similar countries around the world. Um, and all these things are not true. <laughs> so I'll just give you a few factoids to show that. Um, one is that in terms of most immigrants are unauthorized. In fact, in the workforce, unauthorized immigrants make up about 5% of the total workforce. These are two, 2018 numbers. And in the population as a whole, because many unauthorized immigrants are children, um, it's a much higher number of about 23%, but nothing like the majority. Um, most immigrants are legal permanent residents, that's what LPR stands for, or naturalized citizens. Um, and there are a few other categories as well of sort of temporary legal status. Um, uh oh, what's happening with my, <laughs> sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, most immigrants are not Latinx, about less than half are. Um, you can see the figures here, about a little over a quarter are Asian, 10% are black. Um, now, uh, the category, which the government calls Hispanic still, Latin or Latinx in contemporary language, um, is not the same as race. So um, many Latinx people also identify with a race. They might be black, they might be Asian actually, or they might be white. And in the immigrant population as a whole, almost half, 46% identify as single race whites, as opposed to mixed race white plus something else. Um, so, okay, so that's another one. Immigrants are basically just about as educated as um, the US born population roughly a third in both groups. It's 1% less than that for immigrants over age 25 are college graduates, 33% of the US born. Notice that for some populations, notably African immigrants and Asian immigrants, um, a much higher percentage are co college graduates than among the US born. So that's another myth. Um, and the last one in terms of the share of immigrants in the population in this country as of 2018, 14% of our population is, was born somewhere else. That number is more than twice as high in Switzerland um, and in Australia. In Canada, it's 22%. Anyway, and you can see some other examples there. So um, this idea that the country is full, that there's no room for any more new arrivals, um, if we look at around the world at what other countries are doing becomes questionable. Um, Okay, so I'm, I just want to share with you a little bit more. In terms, this is also kind of debunking conventional wisdom um, from a couple of chapters in the book, starting with one by May Nye. Um, those of you who don't know who she is, she's a, a very prominent historian of um, immigration to the U.S., best known for her book, um, Impossible Subjects, which is about the history of um, unauthorized immigration in the 20th century. It's a brilliant book. You should all know about it and read it if you can. Um, in this in our book, she contributed just a chapter. It's actually the opening chapter, and it's quite different from the book I just mentioned. She looks at um, the conditions under which nativism, xenophobia, has flourished. And she's a historian, so she takes up three specific periods of time, one culminating in the Chinese Exclusion Act passed in 1882, which Annie mentioned earlier, another culminating in the 1924 law, which restricted immigration from Europe, basically Southern and Eastern Europe, quite dramatically. And then what we are facing today in terms of not so much new laws, but um, widespread xenophobia. And again, this is a kind of myth busting um, exercise in that many people believe that nativism um, is at its peak in periods of economic downturn, you know, depressions. Um, like say the Great Recession of 2008 or something like that. In fact, she argues that that's not the case, that nativism surges most in periods of economic expansion. Um, and she goes on to show how it is mobilized by demagogues like the previous president to advance their political ambitions. 
Um, and there are, you know, that has happened before. Trump is not the first to exploit um, the, the, to scapegoat immigrants in, in his political uh, rhetoric. Um, so then let me just say a little bit about my own chapter in the book, which um, I know some people here are already familiar with this argument because I've written about it elsewhere too. Um, I take on um, what many people call the immigrant threat narrative, the idea that um, immigrants and especially unauthorized immigrants are a threat to the American, quote unquote, American way of life, that they take away jobs from the U.S. born, that they increase crime, that they threaten the U.S. culture, that they're a burden on taxpayers, all that stuff. Um, I focus in particular on the labor market um, effects of immigration and argue that while it's true that non-college educated U.S. born workers um, are in, you know, have a very serious set of problems and challenges right now, um, those are not due to immigration. And that in fact, they're due to other things among them, attacks on labor unions on the part of employers, um, deregulation, deindustrialization, which I'll say more about in a second, and growing inequality. Those are the things that have um, spurred the, the reversal of fortune of once, um, you know, people who used to have so-called middle-class jobs that were, you know, that paid a decent wage and had benefits tied to them like health care and pensions and so on. And that has evaporated in the last few decades in the same period in which immigration has increased. But um, as we all say in, in, the, in the social sciences, correlation is not causation. And I argue that the um, sequence of events suggests that the causality goes in the opposite direction, that um, immigration is a result more than a cause of these changes. I want to just say a little bit about the, the deindustrialization piece, because it's sort of astonishing, but you will find that in um, one recent report calls them factory towns in places where there used to be a lot of manufacturing and where plants have closed down or shrunk in their workforce downsized dramatically. Um, often there are very few immigrants around because as May Nye argues, it's economic expansion that attracts immigrants, especially um, you know, working class immigrants, non-college educated folks. Um, and yet, in deindustrialized locations, xenophobia is often at its peak. Those were the regions that were most likely to be attracted by um, Trump's worldview, which makes very little sense if you think about it. How could you blame an influx of new arrivals from, you know, Mexico, Central America, wherever, for a factory closing and moving its jobs to those locations? Yet, people do believe that. So that's an example of, um, you know, the lack of logic or Reason, reasonable evidence for the immigrant threat narrative. That's the sort of extreme example. Um, so I try to get into this in more detail by looking at case studies of a bunch of different industries. Um, among them, paid domestic labor, which I understand Annabelle's class is particularly interested in. So maybe we could talk about that in more detail if you, if you want to. Um, and let me just say a little bit about that now. So the sequence of events in all these cases is that as, um, well, is that US born workers who once populated all these industries overwhelmingly um, abandon jobs that are not as desirable as others that they can get. And after that, employers replace them with immigrants. So in paid domestic labor, the dynamic is a little bit different than in things like con the construction industry, which once was highly unionized. Um, the work was done overwhelmingly by non college educated white men um, who earned pretty good pay, had benefits, et cetera. Um, and starting in the 70s and 80s, the employers in that industry really went after, especially in the residential sector of construction. They went after the unions, they cut wages, benefits evaporated and so on. And so a lot of the workers who were doing that work looked at that and thought, I'm not doing this anymore. This is not an okay job in the case of construction, we kind of know where they went. A lot of them moved into commercial construction, which was still well-paid and unionized and so on, um, particularly on the West Coast where you guys are. Um, anyway, so that's one story. And there are other industries which are similar to that, mostly um, male-dominated industries. Paid domestic labor is a little different. That was never a good job. It was never unionized. It never had benefits, et cetera. It's not like these others. Um, However, it was overwhelmingly um, work performed by African-American women. 
Um, and there too, for different reasons, those workers abandoned the sector. And that took place in the 1970s after um, civil rights legislation, most importantly, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, opened up other opportunities for African-American women who never really, where were basically restricted to jobs like paid domestic labor, which they never um, cherished. It, it had all these historical legacies like reminders of slavery and um, racial degradation. And as soon as other opportunities opened up, they were out of there. And um, then people started hiring immigrants to do that work. So the dynamic is the same in terms of the causality is going in the opposite direction of what the threat narrative suggests, but it's very different for the case of, um, for female dominated jobs, especially domestic labor. Um, okay, so that's uh, probably um, more than you wanted to know. Let me tell you a teeny bit about some of the other chapters. There's a lot of them, so I'm just gonna give you a very quick uh, overview and then we can um, discuss this. There's a chapter by Christina Jimenez about who is herself a DACA recipient and used to head the group United We Dream that is a you know account of um, the, the trajectory of that movement. There's a wonderful chapter by a guy called Sackett Sonai who heads a group called Resilience Force about climate change and climate refugees. That's the only chapter in the book that treats this, but it is something you're gonna be hearing a lot more about in the coming years. Um, we also have one from um, a bunch of people from Make the Road New York, which is a worker center in New York that does a lot of um, immigrant advocacy. And that one looks at the links between corporate power and, and um, immigrant detention centers, which are many of them privatized. And they ran a bunch of campaigns challenging that, which some of which were fairly successful. Um, Angelica Salas, some, that may be a name some of you know, um, who's based in LA and has been involved for um, years and years in the immigrant rights movement. She gives a kind of overview of that history in the form of an interview. Um, and then, and I know Annibal wants to talk about this more. I believe her class, the students in the class have read the chapter by Eliseo Medina, um, for, who's retired from a uh, high level position in the service employees union. Um, so we have an interview with him as well as one with Dee Taylor of the um, hotel workers. Um, so, in, one other thing we attempted to do in this book is to not just look at um, what's wrong with the Stephen Miller slash Donald Trump policies, but, you know, if we were in charge, what would we have to figure out? And one of those things is so-called future flow is the term policy people use, which just means what would be the rules? Suppose we were able to legalize all the unauthorized folks who are already in the country, 11 million of them, which, by the way, we're kind of there in terms of public opinion. I'm not saying it's necessarily gonna happen, but the vast majority of Americans think that that's what should happen. Um, so that we've won people over to that view. But by focusing so much on that, we've had very few conversations about, okay, suppose that's done, then what? Who, um, who comes across the border legally after that? What, how many people, what kinds? Um, or is it going to be an employment-based thing, family reunification? There are just a million questions about that. And um, Justin Guest's chapter, he's one of the other academic authors, um, tries to confront that in the context of what other countries are doing. Um, there's a wonderful chapter by a lawyer called Peter Markowitz on enforcement. Another thing that, again, if we were in charge, if progressives were in charge, we would have to figure out. And he points out that immigration enforcement is very odd compared to other kinds of legal enforcement in that there are basically two outcomes. Either you get legal status and maybe citizenship after that, or you get deported. And there's almost nothing in between, which makes very little sense um, compared to you know, ordinary um, enforcement of criminal law, for example, where there's a whole spectrum of possibilities of what can happen. Um, so now an uh, undocumented immigrant who is arrested for not having a light bulb in their car or driving you know, through a red light or whatever it is, can be deported for that, essentially. Um, a little bit crazy. So he tries to think about what would be a reasonable policy. Um, Maria Elena Hincapie, um, another advocate who heads up the um, National Immigration Law Center in LA um, and was part of the uh, group that was trying to think ahead for the Biden administration about what their policy should be, talks about, among other things in her chapter, the right to stay in your own country, which is not possible for everyone. Think about the situation in Central America right now, for example, as well as the right to move. In other words, people should have all those options and she elaborates that. 
Um, and then the concluding chapter by my colleague Deepak Bhargava tries to make a case for what he calls the Statue of Liberty plan. That is um, going back to the approach that prevailed in the early 20th century um, of expanding legal immigration to the US. I don't know if people listening know this, but in the, in the, until 1920, well, until World War I roughly, um, very few European immigrants were turned away if they wanted to come to the US, roughly 1%. Basically everybody was welcome. And he makes a case for you know, reviving that kind of approach. And then finally, I'll mention a chapter by Cecilia Munoz, who was part of the Obama administration actually um, in, in the immigration world and still is involved in Democratic Party discussions of this. And she tackles the whole question of the U.S.-Mexico border and how the, you know, how, what the policy should be there, um, which, as we've seen with the recent episodes involving Haitian refugees, you know, is a very problematic um, set of practices at the moment. So what would it mean to... So the things in the second column here are really all about trying to figure out what, what would a good policy look like. Um, so you can read more about that if you're interested in the book is available where, uh, wherever books are sold, as they say. Um, let me just say a little more, and this is more for Annabelle students about immigrants and the labor movement by special request, and then, then I'll stop. Um, you know, it's not that long ago in the 1970s and 80s, as recently as that, um, most labor union leaders and officials basically saw immigrants as a threat, especially unauthorized immigrants, that these were people who were, quote, willing to work for less money than U.S. born workers. And, that you know, they basically bought into what I called before the immigrant threat narrative. Um, and that began to change. And it is kind of a West Coast story um, in the 1990s when there were successful efforts to unionize immigrant workers, um, especially low wage workers. The most famous of these is Justice for Janitors, which some of you may know about. Um, that's kind of the iconic case, but actually there were a bunch of others as well. And so once that happened and um, labor union folks began to see that actually immigrants were quite easy, I'm sorry, were quite um, eager to organize given the chance um, to do so, which very few get that chance, I might add. Um, they began to change their view and question the threat narrative. And then in the year 2000, right at the turn of the century, AFL-CIO policy officially did a 180 degree change. That's explained in the um, LSA and Medina piece that Annabelle students have already read. Um, and starting, you know, after that, organized labor actively supported the immigrant rights movement, a complete turnaround from how it had been a few decades earlier. Um, they've been quieter about this recently, which is something we might want to talk about, but still, the official positions are very pro-immigrant rights. Um, and there is another side to this, which I think is really important, and it, it started in California, but has now spread to a few other places, which is a process of um, recognizing that immigrants are a potential political force, immigrant workers and their communities. So organized labor starting in Southern California and more recently elsewhere has engaged in this mobilization process that works like this. First, they try to identify immigrants who are eligible for naturalization, for citizenship. Um, this is not unauthorized immigrants, obviously, although unauthorized immigrants can help identify those folks. Um, and then encourage them to apply for naturalization, assist them in that process. Once naturalized, they can register to vote. And once registered to vote, they can be mobilized to show up at the polls. Um, so this is something that began in reaction to Proposition 187. I know the students in any bus class are too young to remember this, but it was a very big deal in the 1990s. And they, it really transformed California politics in many ways. And I think we've seen the fruits of that very recently in the attempt to recall Governor Gavin Newsom, which um, was defeated with the enormous help of Latino votes that were mobilized by these folks. Um, not just labor, but the immigrant rights movement more generally. The D. Taylor um, chapter in our book documents a similar process that took place in Nevada, which the Culinary Workers Union there, which represents workers in casinos and restaurants um, in Las Vegas and Reno, um, also mobilized in this, exactly this way and has transformed almost single-handedly Nevada into a first a purple and increasingly a blue state. Something similar is underway in Arizona and 
Um, the, the same union that Dee Taylor is now heading nationally, though, it's called Unite Here. The here part stands for employee, hotel and restaurant employees, um, has been, was very active in 2020 in um, Pennsylvania, where they organized door, you know, canvassing and so on, and also in Georgia, both in 2020 and early 2021. So this is something that, that um, the labor movement is doing um, actively behind the scenes often, but it's a hu huge contribution to um, you know, trying to transform the broader political environment and with it, hopefully, immigration policy. Um, so obviously right now there are enormous challenges, not only for immigration policy, but also for union organizing more broadly of anybody, immigrants or US born workers. But um, what I think we can say is that in the labor union world, there's um, a real appreciation of the crucial role of alliances across race and ethnic divisions and national and divisions by immigration status. Um, so having said all that, I'm going to stop there. Having said all that, um, you know, Biden did a lot of stuff at the very beginning of his administration to reverse some of the um, executive orders that Trump had issued in relation to immigration. That can be done at the stroke of a pen, and he did do that. But we're still waiting for the real conversation about immigration policy. It has not been front and center for him. And so, and that's unfortunate. But um, you might know that right now, as Congress debates the so-called Build Back Better Act, there's a whole struggle going on to include immigration reform in some manner in that bill. I can, it's a kind of an inside baseball story, but I can talk more about that if people are interested. Um, and there've been a bunch of protests recently in Washington um, trying to make that happen. It's very much an uphill thing. Um, as you all know, he has prioritized, his administration has prioritized other things over immigration. So our book was written in the hope that this would be actively debated by lots of people and that hasn't happened yet. Maybe it still will. So I'll stop there, thanks. That's great. I hope you could hear the applause we are live. <laughs> I can, thank, thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. Uh, you've made some really, really excellent and um, substantive points that we'd like to take you up on. Um, I have gathered some questions actually from the class based on the readings, and they have a couple of chapters that you've mentioned in their, on their syllabus. Uh, we also have a couple of questions from the audience that are listening live. Um, and I would encourage people who are uh, listening in to continue putting their questions. But I've gathered a couple of questions um, in advance right now, and I'd like to pose these um, by combining you know, several, both live and remote. So you mentioned the Build Back Better bill in Congress right now. Uh, we could see that the Obama administration and, both the, and the Trump administration used the workplace to enforce immigration restrictions. And we have seen you know, the, the um, problems with that. Um, how do you propose that um, there could be challenges um, to that, as well as how can we instill fair treatment in workplaces, given of course the fact that we don't have a PRO Act yet passed? Um, so what more could be done to, to protect immigrants in workplaces and, and you know, how could the, those um, be strengthened, the protections that already exist? That's one question. The other question is, um, going, building on this idea of a pathway to citizenship, how do we, from a policy perspective, um, have laws um, that examine or that implement the possibility of a world without borders. So how can we dream about a world without borders uh, or that allegiance to a nation and citizenship becomes obsolete? And lastly, um, we have an aging population and many challenges to some of the policies that have protected people in retirement, social security, Medicare, they are under threat right now. How can we, or is the promotion of immigration of young people and families a possibility? And would those, would those kinds of 
uh, immigration reform policies address the problems that we are facing today? In other words, how can we reverse this immigrant threat narrative to make it a more positive? Thank okay, you. well, that's a lot to chew on. Um, let me start with the last one, which is the simplest, I think. Um, you know, even without specifically encouraging young folks and younger people to come, immigrants tend to be younger than the US born. That's just kind of how it works. Older people are much less likely to pull up roots and move to a country where they, you know, have never been or don't speak the language or whatever. So already the immigrants that are here and including the unauthorized are contributing to um, Social Security and Medicare by paying taxes if they are employed. Um, and yeah, increased immigration would help further with that. And we have a looming crisis with the aging of the population, not just the United States, most countries have this. In the US, it was sort of moderated for a while. You know, immigration has not, there hasn't been much since the Great Recession, I wanna emphasize. There's a little, but before that, there were lots of people coming and working here and um, contributing to all those things, Social Security and Medicare. That has basically stopped. And meanwhile, the population continues to age and the problems those funds face have continued to grow. So the, there's kind of a convergence between what's been happening for longer in places in Western Europe, for example, in other rich countries. Japan has the most extreme um, problem this way of an aging population and very few, they, they accept very, very few immigrants. So, um, you know, this is kind of a no brainer that and it's not just about paying taxes, but think about the um, home care crisis that we have already and that is gonna only grow. There's a huge shortage of, of people, partly because it pays so poorly, who are interested in working as home care attendants. Um, the ones who are doing it are mostly immigrants. Actually, that varies a lot around the country, but he, on the two coasts where all of us are to, in this um, meeting today, that's the case. Um, so that's another thing you would have a, if you had more open immigration there, you would help solve that problem as well as the tax problem. And, you know, the most recent census just underscored this. So we're, we're facing a situation where the number of active workers, um, is going down relative to the number of retirees. And it's just not sustainable in any of those ways. So, you know, that is part of the argument for why we should expand rather than, um, restrict immigration. Um, so I'm going backwards in the order of the questions you posed. Hmm. Pathway to citizenship in a world without borders. We do not advocate open borders in this book. I know there must be people in this meeting who would. Um, our view is that that is not winnable in, I mean, it probably it's, it's already an uphill battle to win something much more modest and that what, what you can get potential political support for is an expanded, um, a more welcoming immigration policy with expanded numbers of refugees as well as voluntary immigrants um, and an orderly system. I think what upsets people the most is on the left and the right is the kind of things that we've been seeing recently at the border where you know large numbers of people, including young children are showing up, being treated very badly by US officials and there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's, you know, the policy is very um, ambiguous to them and actually even to some of the policymakers and, and the, whole, the whole system is dysfunctional. So that needs to be replaced by a much more clear cut organized policy that does welcome folks, but probably it can't welcome them in unlimited numbers and win any kind of political support. Um, and we could debate whether in an ideal world you would want totally open borders, maybe. Um, but, you know, that's just not in the cards, it seems to me. So at least our goal is to try to post policies that have some chance of being adopted. Um, the pathway to citizenship is separate. Like, and, and one of the things that's being debated in the immigration advocacy community, um, I mentioned before the right to stay in the country you're born in or that you're used to living in. There are, there might be people who would prefer to be temporary migrants to the United States, come here, work, whatever, earn some money and go back home, which used to be very commonplace practice. And we think that should be an option. It shouldn't be forced on anyone. We don't want to revive the Bracero program or something like that, but that if people want to do that, that that should, so that is kind of, it's not a world without borders, but it's a version of of that, um, as well as others who might want to move permanently or who have to move permanently because their 
a home country has been devastated by war or climate change. Um, you know, the Afghan refugees are an interesting example here because that is a population where there is popular support for a welcoming approach, um, similar to what happened at the end of the Vietnam War, as some of you may be old enough to remember, probably not, but maybe some of the people in the class are, are familiar with that if you're from the Vietnamese community. Um, that approach should be extended to other countries as well, where maybe there wasn't a war that the US waged, but there was um, climate change that's due partly or largely to the um, emissions created by this country. We should we have as a nation some responsibility to accept people who are displaced because of things like that. So, and that's a lot of places in the world. So, um, you know, that's another way to think about it. So there are people who simply want to move because economic opportunities are greater here than in their country. And I'm in favor of that too, but the, um, I think immigration basically is good for the US economy and for the population. And I didn't address the, the other parts of the immigrant threat narrative other than the employment ones, which are, you know, this idea that immigrants promote crime, you know, all the data show that actually um, immigrant dominated neighborhoods have less crime than those that are dominated by US born people. So, you know, that's another myth that I didn't, I didn't include in my list earlier, but it's really important to know. Um, all right, workplace enforcement. I think you mean like um, enforcing minimum wage laws and things like that, or are we talking about um, enforcement of immigration law? Um, but also so, how raids were often used to actually dissuade and, and stifle union yeah. organization. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, it, it's not really true that that happened under Obama. It happened a lot under Bush. It pretty much stops once Obama is in power. Although, as we know, he did not um, follow through on the promises of comprehensive immigration reform that were part of his campaign. The only thing that did occur, which is not trivial, but um, you know, is not the whole is not the whole enchilada, <laughs> was DACA, which for people who don't know stands for. Um, deferred action for childhood arrivals. Maybe there are some DACA students in any bus class. I don't know. I have some. Um, so these were young people, the, the dreamer population who came to the U.S. as kids and, you know, a company, in the company of their families and um, have now some legal rights, although they're constantly being threatened by, um, you know, right wing lawsuits and stuff. Under Trump, there were there were a lot of workplace raids, um, and that create you know as well as neighborhood raids and so on, and that did create a lot of um, fear in immigrant communities. There's no question about it. So that has pretty much stopped under Biden. I mean, I haven't heard of any such raids. So that this is kind of a Republican um, activity most of the time. But you know, people are still nervous about it. There's another, I thought you were asking something else, which is, um, you know, employment and labor law enforcement, which has been a huge problem. And in immigrant dominated sectors of the economy, it's especially widespread that employers pay people less than the legal minimum wage and so on. So that's a different kind of enforcement, which there isn't enough of. Um, the, the Build Back Better thing, I'll just give you a little bit of the inside baseball there. So what happened most recently is that the Senate parliamentarian, an unelected official in the Senate, determined that the original proposals for immigration reform, which would have given some kind of path to citizenship for most of the undocumented population, that that did not have enough um, budgetary significance to be included in a reconciliation package. I know this is, there's a lot of jargon here. Reconciliation is um, a, a process in the US Congress that allows a law to be passed um, with a simple majority instead of the 60 votes in the Senate that are you know, needed to overcome a filibuster. Um, and so the, if the Build Back Better thing becomes law, this includes things like childcare, um, expansion, potentially paid family leave, in, including, uh, sorry, more tax credits of the kind that we have already come into existence, et cetera. It's not clear what's in the package right now. That's being debated as well, but things like that. If that becomes law, it will be through that process because it's not. there's no other possible path forward. So right now, she's ruled that immigration can't be part of that. There are 
alternatives like that are being explored right now. I don't know how likely they are. One is that the vice president, Kamala Harris, has the power to ignore the parliamentarian's recommendation and just go ahead. I don't think that's very likely, but it's possible. And they are exploring other mechanisms to try to get some kind of gains for immigrants in that law, but it's very much an uphill thing. I, I wouldn't want to make any predictions about what's going to happen with that. Did I cover everything you asked about? <laughs> I tried. <laughs> There were huge areas, and thank you very much for your comments. They were really, really helpful. Um, some of the students want to stick to the, to the question about uh, workplace enforcement and also turn that more toward the, turn the lens toward the labor movement itself and unions and uh, workplace organizing. Um, there's a question here about the effects of under the table jobs uh, on organizing, uh, because this is an attractive, option for many immigrants who have face other obstacles in the labor market. How have labor unions dealt with it? How are they dealing with it? What would you suggest um, that we as a on the progressive side um, deal with um, working for cash and the prospects of organizing? Well, so there, there has been there have been organizing efforts um, in sectors like that. Actually, some well, it's more widespread than you might think, working for cash and whatnot. But most of it has been done not by labor unions, but by lab what's sometimes called alt-labor organizations, worker centers, like I mentioned one before, Make the Road New York here in New York, but there are more than 100 of these around the country, including quite a few in the Bay Area and in Southern California as well. Um, and their approach to organizing is not necessarily focused on creating a labor union, although some of them have attempted that, but more on um, advocating for those workers and, or, and in helping educate folks about the rights that they do have under the law. Maybe people don't know this. Employment and labor laws apply with very, very few exceptions, just the same way they do to U.S. born workers, to immigrant workers, regardless of legal status, authorization or whatever. If they're employed in the United States, they are covered by things like minimum wage laws, even the right to unionize. So that's a right that is honored more in the breach for everyone nowadays than the observance. Um, anyway, so the worker center's um, mode of operation is typically to both um, educate and try to empower and develop leadership among workers in the informal economy in what you call under the table jobs, um, and also to make sure they know about their rights and to help them pursue redress if their rights are violated, rights to the minimum wage, for example, which are commonly violated in that sector. Paying people in cash, by the way, is not illegal, but it is required that um, they are paid the minimum wage, that any deductions from their pay are recorded in writing and things like that. Um, so, but these laws are not very well enforced, especially in more informal jobs. So again, there's some unions have gotten involved in this, but it's basically the worker center um, movement that has taken that stuff on. We have slowly run out of time, um, <laughs> but we really, really appreciate you being with us, Ruth, today to shed more light on progressive labor policy and immigration policy, more generally speaking. Um, and we appreciate having your book in hand. As I mentioned, there are a couple more readings from the book in, on the syllabus. And we look forward to also taking advantage of the discount that your publisher has offered for the um, e-version and the soft cover book. So I wanted to just mention to all the participants that you can tap into that. Um, the code will be provided. We thank you, Ruth, for joining us, and we look forward to more of your work in the future. Oh, thank you, Annie Bell, and thanks so much for the invitation, and thanks to everyone who came. I really, thanks for listening. <laughs>